Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 305 for Monday, the 24th of May, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in New Pomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Howdy doody, Paul Kent. How you doing, man? Good, man. How's it going today? It's going. I have to wish a uh, happy Lakeside Park Day to all my fellow Rush fans out there because uh, because that's what today is. So It's also... Go. Bob Dylan's birthday. Well, you know, these things coincide once a year, no matter <laughs> no matter what. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bob. Happy birthday, the bard. Uh, there's one other person I'd like to mention, Paul, and that is our guest for today. We are so honored and thankful to have Brian Geller from both Ultimate Ears and the singer for the Atomic Punks join us today. Brian, thanks for taking time to chat with us. Good morning, guys. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, all right. So, like, I don't even know where to start. Let's start with the Atomic Punks, because that, that's, that's got to be interesting. So tell us about this, this band. This is a tribute band, right, for Van Halen, the Atomic Punks? Yes, it's a tribute band. And if you can believe it, the Atomic Punks have been around for 27 years. Holy crap. Oh, wow. And have you so. been with them the whole, like, all the way through? I have not. I've been I've been with the punks now. This is my twelfth year. Oh, okay. And um, it's uh, it's such a blast playing classic Van Halen. The uh, the original singer is Michael Starr from uh, Steel Panther. Yeah, if you're familiar with Steel Panther. Yeah, him and Satchel came from the Atomic Punks. There for there was for a while. There, they were previously metal shop and they were doing that on Friday nights and in Hollywood. And then the punks would be Saturday night. So that eventually turned into a whole beast of a thing. And yeah. that kind of opened the door for me, which is interesting because I had seen the punks uh, in the early 2000s, about 2002, I had never sang in my life. And Wait, what? I went to a house, of, I went to a house of blues show. And these guys come out on stage and, you know, I'm a big Van Halen fan and her, had heard about this band. And these guys came out on stage, you know, and I'd seen Van Halen, you know, Women and Children First Tour, Fair Warning. I mean, back in the, I mean. Yeah, the back in the, the real day. Yeah. Sure. Right. And I finished watching these guys and I was like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I want to do that. <laughs> How can I do that? And my wife looks at me, she says, we you kind of need to know how to sing. I'm like, well, nobody knows David Lee Roth better than I do. We've been practicing, <laughs> wait, wait, you, practicing you, this in my bedroom my whole life. I can, you weren't in a band before this? Never been in a band. <laughs> oh my gosh. Never had done it before. Never had done it before. You Baptism just, by fire. You just decided it was going to happen. I just decided it was going to happen. So within a couple months, I was taking vocal lessons. And if you could hear those cassettes, it was awful. It was really bad. But, you know, the one thing I had going for me is not that, you know, David Lee Roth was known for being a great singer anyway. So right. I just kept working at it, working at it. And then I found these guys that had been looking for a David Lee Roth. And I found out that it was kind of a tough part to find. You know, there's a million guys out there that can sing, but you know, singing like David Lee Roth's kind of a, it's a different a thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Well, it's actually, I, I actually have a lot of questions about this because <laughs> yeah, the same. Yeah. I, I, I don't know that there, you can pick out a great classic rock singer that is just more innate emoting of sounds than David Lee Roth. I mean, all those screams he did. I mean, that's right. not stuff you learn in vocal lessons, right? I mean, I guess, I guess a good teacher can kind of get you in the ballpark about how to use your instrument, but if you're coming from ground zero, never sung in a band for, and you're tackling David Lee Roth and all those really, you know, unique machinations that were David Lee Roth. But again, he's not a classic. He's just right. emoting rock and roll. How, how did you get there? It just took a lot of practice and a lot of, a lot of patience from the guys that I work with. It's funny. I just hung up a little while ago with Dave Stroud, who's a, a, a big time vocal coach out here in Hollywood. And we were talking about that. I was like, gosh, my voice really feels strong right now, which is 
interesting because, you know, the gigs are just starting to come back around. We just played the other day and yeah. we've been getting busy the last couple months. And, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, it, it's taken, they say to be a professional in anything, you have to do it 10,000 10, times. Hours. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think I add all the times I sang running with the devil in my bedroom growing up to all the times I did it, you know, live the last 15 years or so. And, you know, so, it's finally so with I this, feel like it's coming in. Like how did you decided you wanted to do it, but how did you let, did you know the guys in the band? How, like, how did that, because, because I, like, we've all been out there watching a band play and said, oh, I'd like to be up on stage with them. But then like, you, you don't, you it, it just doesn't <laughs> happen. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of fun. It's it was I went to a Van Halen Van Halen forum page, you know, kind of a geeked out Van Halen page where people talked about their favorite song and debated about Sammy Hagar and David Lee Roth and all sure. that stuff. And and there was somebody that was looking, and I was like, wow, if I could go and see these guys and audition and actually just have a recording of me singing to 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 right. guys actually playing the music. I was fully on board with that. So this was just so a, a live band karaoke opportunity for you. Yeah, it really was. Okay. Some dude's house. And and so um, the first band I auditioned with, they, they didn't take me. They like, they loved my enthusiasm, but they didn't want <laughs> me. And then I found another guy. And interestingly enough, that guy, that was a band called Eruption. And Al Estrada in that band was David Lee Ross touring guitarist last year wow. when he did the thing opening for kiss in fact two of yeah. our the original the guitar player number one and number two for the atomic punks actually were picked firsthand by david lee roth we lost our first two guitar players to get uh, to, to roth so it's been kind of this weird minor league camp for, <laughs> for the big band you're, you're the, fe you're the so, feeder you're the feeder team man yeah so it's it's fun and that's how it, it all started off so you know that was probably about 2003 2004 and and i was on my way and did it for about five six years and we were just constantly chasing after the atomic punks that were you know they owned all of it and uh you know that's when ralph left and they called me up and said would you be interested and i'm like ah, that's kind of kind of weird to leave a one you know not weird to leave one band to go to another band but if you're leaving a van halen tribute to go to another van halen tribute it's a little it was a little dicey to do it yeah, i could see that and but when i played with these guys at that level i was like i could never go back it That's was amazing. just it was incredible That's so great. um uh you cover all of van halen's catalog right so you're you're covering sammy and you're covering david oh no right? we just do dave there's no okay. way i could sing I'll be honest with you. There's no way I could sing Sammy stuff. Sammy is could, one of the highest range singers. Yeah, it, 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 among many other things he does well, his range is astronomical. Yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely, Dave. I mean, he is such a talented vocalist and he still sings amazing. He does. You know, still. I think I could do, I think we've broke into like finish what you started, something like that. It's sure. A little, low, low and gravelly, you know, that, you know, something you can kind of, you know, th that worked for my voice, but yeah, we just, we primarily do the, you know, you do the first six albums and yeah. it's difficult too, because, you know, when you go out and do Van Halen, you know, typically it's a 90 minute set and there's probably 12 to 15 songs you have to play every time. Right. All right so this is, this is a tribute thing, right? Yeah, so we do. You are, know, my question is: Are you dressing up like that? Are you? You got a wig on? You are you doing oh, yeah. jumps? Are you doing? Oh all yeah, that you got to watch some of these videos, Paul. In fact, we'll put a link to some of these in the show notes so everybody can can see them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. we do the whole thing. I mean, I think for me, you know, I'm 53, and it's you know, you got to realize you're pretty athletic. You're playing somebody that was 23. Yes. So, you know, it's funny, you know, I make sure and stay in shape and I can do the kicks and all that stuff. And I come out and do the screams and I pay a lot of good money for those wigs and stuff. So <laughs> people are coming and going, man, that's amazing. Is that your hair? I'm like, well, <laughs> give it a poll and see what you think, you know? And, <laughs> and so it's, but I think I've scaled down the, the look just a little bit. It's for a guy that's on the eve of being 54 coming out with big uh, white, leg warmers it's a little odd you, you still <laughs> so, it, so i i it, long time listeners will know i've been asked the question where do you get your onesies so i need to ask you the question where do you get your spandex are you still wearing the spandex or is that uh yeah I actually, have a, I actually have a girl that makes all my stuff that's in mm -hmm. australia that she makes some really good things in fact my latest pair of pants 
um, look exactly like the pants Peter Chris wore during the Alive tour. Yeah, I had him had to change it just a little bit. So, you know, for me, I'm six foot two, so I'm a little bit taller than your typical lead singer. So, um, leg warmers kind of just make me look like I'm about six eight, six nine. So I kind of <laughs> make sure I've got the nice tight spandex type pants, but then with a cool flare bell bottom to kind of give it that that late seventies edge awesome. to it. So, so you, it's you, funny to see some of the Daves out there that, you know, weigh about weigh like two forty, and they're out there sporting <laughs> it without a shirt on. I'm like, man, you got a lot more guts than I would. I wouldn't yeah. do that. Sure. So you, speaking of Sammy, you got an opportunity to play with Sammy and Michael Anthony. Is that right? Yeah. I got really lucky with that one. That was before the atomic punks. Oh, and Michael wow. Anthony has been, on stage with the punks a number of times over the years. He's a big fan of the band. And so, um, yeah, it was, Sammy was playing out in DeVore in San Bernardino here in California. And for anybody that's from Southern California and is in his, our age group, they'll remember that that was the home of the us festival in 1983 heavy metal day. So, um, anytime you can see a, a show out there, it's great. So basically Sammy was playing out there, and his first set was going to be Red Rock or Solo Sammy stuff. Then he'd take a break. And then the second set would be uh, um, uh, Van Hagar material. So he actually hired our band to play the Cabo Village outside the venue. So That's like, cool. wow, these guys are going to pay us to do this show. We're going to have tons of Van Halen fans. Then we get we actually get to stay and see the show. So it was like just a win-win opportunity. And I'm thinking, wow, it's like, I'm going to be, able, not that we were playing on the stage, but I'm going to be outside the venue that I saw. I was at the S Festival as a kid. So we did our set. We played two sets. It went off real well. It was a lot of fun. People were having a good time. And I was changing after the show. And Sammy's manager came up and introduced himself. He goes, I don't know if you know it, but Sammy came, snuck down and, and watched you guys and really loved the show, loved what you what you did. He thinks it would be amazing if you wouldn't mind coming out and doing a song with him that night that you oh. know, he thinks the fans would just think it was great. And you got to remember, this is probably like 2005, 2006. So I'd only been doing this. I'd only wow. been singing, you know, maybe two years. So I was like, absolutely. You know, so we go, I go backstage and that's when I found out that Michael Anthony was there. No one knew that Michael Anthony was going to be there. Oh, this was so, right. This was before Michael was playing with Sammy regularly. Right, right, right. 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 So I met Sammy before I met Michael, Michael Anthony's dad was there. I got to spend literally 45 minutes with just him and I in a room and he was telling all these stories. And so the, the idea was that when they started the second set, which was the Van Hagar set, Michael Anthony would just walk out. Right. So Michael Anthony walks out. The place goes nuts. They had no idea that he was going to be there. Sammy and I are on the side of the stage and I'm like just shaking. This is the S festival stage. This yeah, is amazing. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A total dream. What'd you say? And Sammy's standing there. He goes, he goes, okay, we'll, we'll share the same microphone. Da, da, da. We're going to do running with the devil. And I'm like, whatever you want, whatever <laughs> you want. You, 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 know, you say the word boss. That's yeah. right. And I'm in the whole, I'm in the whole David Lee Roth uniform and everything. I was wearing the spandex and, and the lay warmers that night. I had it all going on. And, and, and uh, so right before we go, out, he's like, no, nah, no, nah. he goes, you need your own microphone, do whatever you do. You're great. You know? So we walk out hand in hand after the the first verse of running with the devil. And I think the place about drop because at first second, they weren't sure if it was Dave or not. People hadn't seen Dave that much sure. at that time. And so, yeah, I had about, you know, running with the devils about what, three minutes and 30 seconds. I came in on the second verse. And so I had about a, a, a two minutes of just, you know, living, living a dream. And, and when I was out there, I was like, okay, I need to make sure and do a kick. I need to make sure right. and do a scream. And I need to do something where I need to get the crowd just to sing, you know, because when am I going to get the opportunity to do something like that? So I got all got all three and uh good for you. That that's yeah, that actually cool. that's one of those things like thinking about, you know, you have those opportunities, you find yourself if if you have those opportunities and you're fortunate enough to find yourself in whatever it is at whatever level. 
having the the forethought to say, okay, wait a minute, what do I want to get out of? Like, what do I want to deliver here? And, you know, is there a checklist of my own that I can sort of take with me without negatively impacting the show? Right. And and thinking about that's really smart, man. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it was it was really cool. And I, you know, I had no problem taking advantage of the opportunity and doing it. I would have I mean, imagine not doing it. Oh, no, you don't say no to that. Back. That you, that would be the story you'd be telling us you regretted. Uh, right. right. Did now. he introduce you as Brian Geller? They didn't say anything. Uh, they well, just, just leave just it to the imagination, out. right? We just we just walked out. Next morning, I'm listening to KLOS here locally. They're <laughs> talking about. It. I'm like, wow, that was that was great. But you know, it's I tell I tell my kids, I'm like, you know, don't be afraid to try something. You know, don't look at it as an opportunity past. You know, I didn't start well, until I was in my 30s. We just got to so. pause this. Like, you know, your first band is a Van Halen tribute band and you're playing in with the best Van Halen tribute band. And then you're on stage all within two years. This is yeah. just a crazy story. Yeah. I mean, this so, is amazing. And you're, you're listening. And you're going you got to do what you want to do. Absolutely, man. That's, that's, that's a story. That's there was cool. A kid, uh, there was a young couple at our show the other night and those are always fun because, you know, they, you know, the girl had never even seen a live show before hmm. and they oh, had wow. so much fun. And the guy's like, I kind of sing, I want to sing about them kind of afraid to. And I said, well, how old are you? And he was like 23. I'm like, man, I didn't start singing. That was in my thirties. Love it. Just go out and do it. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. No, that's good advice. All right. I want to, I want to get to the, the live music part of this, the playing live part. And I want to talk about your day job at ultimate ears because that's very well. It's also very relevant to our listeners here too. The the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about our sponsor for this episode. We've all been doing a lot more takeout and deli- like, you know, food delivery to our homes over the past year because that's how things have been. And our sponsor, Every Plate, is here to provide us with an alternative to takeout that's also an alternative and much faster than a trip to the grocery store and starting a meal from scratch because these recipes from Every Plate come together in about 30 minutes. Every Plate provides these easy to follow recipe cards and pre-portioned ingredients. So I get to spend less time prepping and cooking and more time enjoying good food with my family or loved ones. And it's not just the food that I get to enjoy. These recipe cards that every plate comes with are easy for everyone to follow. So suddenly food prep becomes a four person thing instead of a one person thing. You don't have to think about all right, what should I delegate here? You know, there's none of that. It's all right on the card. And everybody says, oh, I'll do this. I'll do that. And now we've got four of us, because that's how many of us are at the house now, prepping a meal together and then eating a meal together. So it really becomes an activity. And every plate is like, I was skeptical at first of the pricing because they're like 50% cheaper than a meal made from grocery store ingredients, which makes now a good time to do this. But I, 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 like I said, I was a little skeptical. They sent us some meals. We checked them out. We loved them so much. We've now been buying from every plate too. And th- they're correct. Like the prices actually are right. And you can try every plate now for just one ninety nine per meal. Yes. $1.99 per meal plus an additional 20% off your next two boxes. And you do that by going to everyplate.com. And entering code GIGGAB199. That's G I G G A B 199. So you got to go to everyplate.com and that's where you're going to get your stuff for $1.99 per meal because you're going to use coupon code GIGGAB199. That's up to a $100 value. Great food, great stuff. I think you're going to enjoy it just as much as I do. Our thanks to Every Plate for sponsoring this episode. All right. So you've played a few gigs recently. I, like, but you, I'm sure you weren't playing, at least not big gigs, uh, over the last year. How did that go? We've talked a lot recently here about the logistics of a gig, in, so, so much so that, you know, we've we've had some listeners write in about people forgetting, like, important bits of gear. You know, you're just out of practice, not just with your instrument, but with, you know, the whole process of getting yourself to the stage. How did those recent gigs go for you? Yeah, it was... Uh it can be a little nerve wracking, you know, it's just literally I had to open up my, my gig bag and and take everything out and take an inventory. And then is everything working? You know, is my wireless equipment working? It's been in this suitcase for a while. And I think for me at the beginning, because we, we did some sporadic shows last year, but there was a period where it was probably a good six months 
yeah. where we hadn't played. And I get a call from Scott, our drummer, and Scott's the original, you know, Atomic Punk's drummer. He's been doing this for 27 years. He goes, we're going to do a streaming thing, you know, at Third Encore in Hollywood uh, with Monsters of Rock. And, you know, there's going to be thousands of people listening to it. And I'm like, dude, are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, to stream a show, you know, is a challenge in itself. To stream a show with a vocalist that's only been singing X amount of years and it's the first show, you know, out the gate. I was very nervous about it. And then we rehearsed, you know, we rehearsed the night before and and Scott and his Southern Twain is like, man, you're a little pitchy. And I'm like, I told you this is how it's going to be, you know? So then I'm like stressed about it. Then you get in your head. What perfect feedback to get mere hours before doing this. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, if you're a singer, get out of your head, just do your thing and, and, and trust yourself. I think, I think that's really, really good advice. Um, So that was, uh, that show ended up, did pretty well for us. We did another show where it was like, okay, you guys are going to be playing inside the club while we've got a camera crew. And then the crowd is going to be outside in the parking lot, watching a big screen. So that was odd. No energy. You know, so you're trying to provide this, this energy for this crowd that's, you know, uh, there, but they're not there. They're outside. So that was a really different one. And then there was a couple of shows where it was very social distanced and people were, were, uh, a little nervous about it. And, you know, I have a bit where during ice cream, man, I'll have somebody sing, sing the last, uh, the last line of ice cream, man. It's like, well, I can't have anybody like singing into my microphone. So <laughs> getting all those weird things that you kind of, you take for granted were difficult. So I would say over the last, we played Sunday or Saturday night here in long beach and the crowd was packed. Everybody was inside. There wasn't a lot of mass and there was a lot of energy people are definitely hungry i, I had for live music. i had that on saturday night too it was my first yeah. time on a big rock stage in a in a long time and like i felt good being on stage and not among the the masses but yeah seeing the people packed together uh, people are hungry for this yes <laughs> yes yes because yes. sometimes you know i mean i'm sure you know this is like you come out and you've got the energy and you can see right away the crowd's like, I need you to show me something first. Right. You got to deliver first sometimes, that. which is fine. And yeah. I tell you what, the other night, though, it was taking candy from a baby. They were yeah. all in from the first note and they were there the whole time. So, I, I, you know, we well. we took the stage black stage, you know, and like it was very underlit. Like I was lucky that I made it to the drum stool without breaking my leg. You know, it was one of those things. And right. uh and it's just, just this like salt of the earth biker bar with a huge stage here in, in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. And um, as soon as the lights came up, I mean, the place roared and it was like, we're the opening act. You have no idea who we are. What the heck is going on oh. in this room? Yeah. Yeah. But it was great. It was like, oh, okay. Pretty cool feeling. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, it yeah. felt so good. Yeah. <laughs> it tastes yeah. good. All right. So tell us about your your gear. Tell us specifically about your your ears. Because in-ears is a topic. This might, well, we... We're a show for people that do this for a living or do this as weekend warriors, really. And so like the gear and all of that stuff is actually interesting. I always tell guests, I don't even know if I told you this, you know, whatever stuff about being in a band is really boring to tell at cocktail parties. That's actually really interesting to us here. So, right. so I'm curious, like what, what do you use for, for as your ultimate ears gear? What, you know, I'm assuming so you use I, ultimate ears. So oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, given the I mean, day I, job, a, we were playing in Arizona a couple of weeks ago and the sound guy just, he couldn't get it together. And, and I basically did that show without ears and it was scary because once you're into ears and you, you have the taste of it and you're doing it, you just you just can't go back. There's no so, way. Oh yeah. Is your whole yeah. band on in, on ears? I'm sorry. Is the whole band on in ears? The whole band's on in ears. So, yeah. um, I right now, well, there's a few models I use. Right now, I'm using kind of our flagship model, the UE Live. Okay. Which is fantastic. Um, most singers and probably guitar players kind of prefer the UE Seven. Right. It's got a lot of good punch, good mid range, and it just comes right out at you. Um, you know, when I first came, what happened was when I came to ultimate ears, um, uh, 
I had just gotten the gig with the Atomic Punks. Okay, I was going to ask which came first, but it sounds like n- almost neither. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was, is I in the other band, I was constantly blowing out my voice. So when I moved over to the Atomic Punks, I helped out the old band. I was literally doing those gigs that were booked, doing Atomic Punks gigs, which they had so so much work lined up. I mean, I was playing, you know, every weekend, both nights. Sometimes they were flyaway gigs and you'd throw in a Sunday night or a a Thursday night before. So it was a lot of work and I was blowing out my voice. And it was to the point I went and saw a doctor and I was having problems with my vocal cords. And, you know, they said, you've got it. You've got to get into in-ear. So that took me down the path of, well, what are in-ears? You know, yeah. how does it work? And it's a confusing thing. When I went in, I'm like, well, do I get the whole setup? Do I get the wireless? How does this work? It's it's all confusing. And so Ultimate Ears kind of guided me through the process and treated me. They treated me like I was actually David Lee Roth, so much so that, you know, I went back to them. I had I had been using them probably a year and and anytime I needed something, they were just right there for me. And so I happened to be in their office one day. I'm like, if you guys ever need anybody, I would love to be a part of this. Like, huh. You guys just you treat everybody great. I love the product. I use it all the time. So that's eventually how I ended up. That's how you got the gig. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm, you know this. I don't know if our listeners know, but the the very core of Ultimate Ears started with uh, Jerry Harvey and yeah. Alex Van Halen. Right. I mean, it was because Alex was crazy? losing his hearing and Jerry helped him figure it out. So. Like, yeah, it's funny. And when I see Jerry at Nam, I'm like, you know, the first time I met Jerry, you know, I walk up and I'm in my UE shirt. And of course, Jerry started UE, but yeah, he's got JH now that that whole dynamic. And I'm like, hey, I just want to say thanks. Yeah. You know, not only not only was Van Halen a big part, that's what's shaped me in what I've done the last 15 years, but it also kind of opened up a door for what my day job, what my career is. So it's yeah. kind of crazy how how it really worked out for me. So it was like a big thanks to Jerry for that. That's awesome. All right. So I, one question, and you you started down this path a little bit, but the question that comes up often for us is when, when someone is making the jump either directly into custom fit in-ears or from some universal fits into custom fits, how do you select and how do you help people select the right model of custom fits because for a lot of people, especially for weekend warriors, that's, it's not one of those trial and error decisions that you get to make just because of the, the, you know, the cost involved. Right. Right. I think there's a couple of things. I think one thing with, with ultimate ears, what we do too, is we have a money back guarantee policy. Oh. So, I mean, to offer a money back guarantee on a custom product, hmm. you know, I mean, we stand by it. We want all of our, all of our customers to be happy. So yeah. One of the things I always tell people that when they're they're demoing different versions, like, do I get a UE5? Do I get the 7? Do I get the live? What do I do? The first mistake people make is when they start to demo, they just, they grab their iPhone and they pop in their favorite music and they listen to the music. And of course, it sounds great. What you need to listen to is how you're going to use them in your application. Yeah. You're going to be in the studio. Are you a studio guy? Do you need some form of reference? Are you going to be on stage? If you're going to be on stage, do you have tracks that that you could play so you could truly hear what it's going to be like? You oh, that's know, a good on idea. Record, you know, because, just doing a recording of your in ear mix would be an interesting right. thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we have we have a dealer actually at Third Encore in LA that you know he's got tracks all set up. So if you're a drummer or you can listen to a live mix of a band. We can bring everything down, bring the drums up. So that way you get a real sense of what it truly sounds like. So, I mean, there's a lot of great in-ear monitor companies out there that make really good product. I mean, everything's going to sound good, but how does it sound for you in your application in, in what you're doing? So I think, I think that's a, that's a big step. Um, The other things I tell people too is um, you know, what are, you know, whether you're whether you're shopping with with me at Ultimate Ears or one of our competitors or what are the lead times? And more importantly, what are the lead times when there's a when there's a service related thing that needs to happen? Because yeah. 
you know, it, the product will ultimately need to be serviced. That's what happens. You, know, you might need to change out a cable. You might have a driver go out. It's just it's it happens. the name of the game. Yeah. So are you a weekend warrior where you just got back from the gig and it's now Monday and you got to have your ears ready to go for, for Friday? So which company is going to be able to deliver? Is it a company that has, you know, four to six weeks lead time? Are they going to be able to turn it around in a day or two? So to me, that's, that's the a good question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. You know, unless you've got, unless you have the money and want to buy a backup pair, are you ready to be on stage with this piece of equipment that once you're into, once you realize the benefits and, and what it, what it does, you really can't be without it. There's no going back. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I, I need to ask a question here. I'm looking at your website because you'd mentioned the UE lives. I play the UE 11 or I use the UE 11s now. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm a drummer. a drummer. Yeah. Right. As a drummer. Yep. I went from the UE sevens and then I lost one of those and, and you, um, and, and Mike Dias, who's also been on the show, Jerry's been on the show as well. So, right. uh, but, uh, but you guys convinced me to, to move up to the 11s and, and thank you for that because it like the difference for me as a drummer made a huge difference. But as I'm looking at the, and I was looking at the prices of the UE live, or I was looking at the details on the UE live and I noticed uh, your prices are all like way lower than they normally are. So is there some special deal happening right now that our listeners should know about? Yes, absolutely. I okay. mean, here, you know, music's coming back. And yeah. so we kind of, what we decided to do was implement a, uh, you know, a spring promo and we started it, you know, we're coinciding with Memorial day weekend. And so we started a little bit earlier so if you're in the market for ears and you want a good price savings, I mean, you can buy UE lives and get $500 off right now. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we're also doing 18s where you can get 400 off. And then your model that you have, the UE 11s, which I love now three, I got a, a little story about the 11s, $300 off on the 11s. I think the 11s for me are my favorite pair, Just but nice. going back to what I was saying before, as a vocalist, for some reason, the 11s for me singing through them just aren't happening. Really? Now I use my pair of 11s for everything else. Uh, when I'm, when I'm working, when I'm listening to music, when I'm traveling, when I'm watching movies on, on an iPad, I always go to the 11s. It's interesting. Cause when I went from the sevens to the 11s, um, I honestly, I think it, it probably wasn't a good AB comparison because I think I learned that the cable wears out probably faster than anything else and really can impact sound quality, like in a huge, at least for me in a huge way. Uh, but I went from my UE sevens with, with whatever cable I had with them at the time. And, uh, and then I went to the 11s and I really felt like the stereo field even opened up more. Uh, it just felt like there was a whole lot more presence to them, which makes a huge difference when I'm getting really a full mix with drums in my ears, right. but I am a singing drummer and I, I love the way I hear my voice through the 11s. I mean, I, I didn't not like it through the sevens. <laughs> it sounded fine, right. but there was more to it with the 11s. I felt um, so, but the, you know, we're all yeah, different, think, right? So yeah, exactly. exactly. You nailed it. I was just going to say that is the beauty of it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Right. Everybody's different. You know, it's, you know, I had 18, I couldn't sing through the 18s. I was like, this is like too much going on. So when we came it's, out with the lives, I'm like, if the 18s were too much, how can I possibly sing through the lives? But the lives actually were fantastic for me. And then for your, for you on the 11s, the drummer in my band, he prefers the 18s over the 11s. He's like, why would I want more, more bass? It's like, that's all I've had my whole life. He goes, I need to dial that back. So, I mean, that's an interesting perspective. From now, drummer, now, so. now you're making me think I need to check out the 18s. So there we go. Everybody's, <laughs> everybody's different. There you go. A question that comes up often is how to get a good mix dialed in for your in-ears. So do you have a secret when you're, especially if you're on a festival stage or something where, you know, you don't have your engineer with you, you're, you know, you've got to suss it out or negotiate it yourself. What's the, how, how do you do it? I have a very strong opinion about this because Excellent. for me, you know, we're, you know, I would say we're a high level tribute band. Yeah. So as a high level tribute band, we don't have a crew. 
we don't have a front of house guy. We don't have our monitor engineer. We're doing it all of ourselves and dealing with what's there. So, right. so you're in that sense, you're weekend warriors, just like the rest of us. Absolutely. I'm yeah. a weekend warrior that plays 40 to 50 shows a year, sometimes yeah. more, sometimes less. So when it comes to the mix, I number one, know exactly what you like. Okay. Number two, to get to number one, when you start off using in-ear monitors, that first time you you hook up with that your mo- that monitor engineer that just gives you that golden mix, you go to that monitor monitor engineer and you ask him exactly what he or she did for your mix and you make sure you know that. So I had years ago, I had never found this right mix that I liked and. We were actually playing in central California at a wedding of all places. Somebody wanted us to play at their wedding. So they loved Van Halen, right? So, um, and it was out on a farm and we're setting up in a barn and, and I look and it's, you know, the board's small and and the guy running the sound is a kid. I'm going, oh man, this is going to be awful. This is not going to be good. Yeah. By the time we finished that show, that was the, by far the best mix I've ever had. So I, I went to the guy, I'm like, what did you do? He goes, well, I EQ'd your voice at about 4K. So ever since then, I always have my voice at 4K. I don't know why, but it sounds good. And when I had that mixed in, I can tell the difference. And yeah. then I realized I need a little reverb in my ears. As a vocalist, that helped out. So that's the problem with reverb is your sound guy's like, oh yeah, no problem. I'm like, oh, when they say that, they know their stuff. Or they're like, let me see what I can do. That means he probably doesn't know stuff. And I'll probably know to ask for reverb when they're uh, sound checking the drums. If my drummer is is hitting that kick drum continuously for three or four minutes, then I know I'm going to have a problem with my mix that night. If he gets it right away and it's a couple of hits, he's like, okay, next left Tom, right Tom. You know, I'm like, okay, I've got a good guy. Now. That's a good, know what I can that is that is the perfect litmus test. I use that too. If I've got to be hitting mm-hmm. that kick drum for more than more than about ten or fifteen times, unless he has some specific thing where he's like, right. hey, you know, hang on, I'm seeing something here, whatever. Uh, right. Uh, otherwise, yep. If you're hitting that forever, and the snare drum too, like it's just, it, yep. You either figure it yeah, out. And I, yep. I think what what can you live with to make your show the best, and what. What can you not live with? You know yeah. what I mean? What What's yeah. going to work? What's going to not? Because if you're not, if I'm not sounding good, the guy with the 1980 Van Halen invasion shirt in the back is not going to go, you know what? These sound guys really suck. No, no. they're going to look at me and go, what does this joker up there think he's doing trying to sing these songs? So cool. it's my responsibility as well as the other band members to make sure we're getting the bat in a, 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 a nice you know, workable way to get the best sound possible. But I think it's just a matter once you figure out what it is that works, it's like, okay, I like hi-hat. I don't want snare, a little bit of bass, start the guitar volume a little bit low. Cause I know the guitar player always turns, always up. turns up. So, yep. you know, so it's, <laughs> it's once you find your balance of what, what works for you, make sure, you know, write it down and memorize it and take that with you everywhere you go. So do you, if you have the option, would you set up your own mix or would you always have the engineer do it for you? I was, I'm horrible at that stuff. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I, I, had I wish the, I could. I had the engineer, I had two, two gigs on Saturday. One of them, the engineer hands me an iPad. He and I know each, actually I knew both the engineers and he's like, here's your feed for your ears. Here's your iPad. He's like, go. I'm like, great. Thanks, man. And then I get to the gig yeah. Saturday night and the guy's like, uh, I'm asked him like, do you want to mix my ears or do you want me to do it? And he's like, I don't know the Wi-Fi password for this mixer. I'm like, uh-huh. I guess it's up to you. Good to go. But I trusted him. Like, I know this uh-huh. guy. I've worked with him before, but um, you know, he, we got it it's, dialed in and it was fine. Yeah. It, it's a, it's interesting. And you're always, all, always learning things. I mean, I picked something up a couple of weeks ago. We, so we're playing at a, I'm not going to say the place cause it was the worst sound guy I've ever had. And the sound was awful. We've played that we've traveled to this location multiple times. It's close to an airport and we couldn't get a frequency when we were scanning for yeah. our ears, which has never been a problem. We finally got it. And it was, it was destruction 
in my ears. All I could think about was the sound of metal and, and, the, and the kid that, that lost his hearing in that movie. And I'm going, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hear tomorrow. And I was so upset because it was like we had a good crowd and this guy could not get it figured out. And he did. What I learned that night is I need to have a pair of generics with me to give to the monitor engineer because this guy couldn't. He had nothing to put it in his ear. If he, he had no if, reference. If the engineer has never done it before and has no reference, you're right. It, it's it's never going to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So David, so, can I tell my you know my sob story of of uh, getting right with an ear? Please. And, yeah. No. I, I I I Paul has had trouble with ears, Brian. So maybe we can help him. Maybe okay, you can let's help. See what him. we can do. <laughs> so my my problem starts this. What happens in a sound check is never the intensity of what the band plays once we hit. And I'm a guitar player and, and a singer. And um, so that's the first thing is that. And there's always. What, so why is it that there's something magical happens that we had it all dialed in? It's exactly. Check and and who, who flipped the switch? Who hit the who hit the reset button? Right. Exactly. So then. So that's the first phase. But the second phase of it is things that change over the course of the gig bother me a lot. You know, if the drummer starts hitting harder, bleed starts happening somewhere. Someone turns up, you know, whatever it may be, those those changes, and they're often not subtle changes. They like my mix is done. It's not the same anymore. That would be the other thing. And then the most common thing for, you know, I, I would say an amateur semi-professional would be once you take the in-ear out, you kind of feel the energy on the stage, it's really hard to go back in. You know, once you're kind of feeling the room and feeling the band in that way, right. it's hard to go backwards. So a combination of those three things is is, you know, never really having that pleasant hermetically sealed experience of of uh, of the in ears just sounding natural things right. changing make me crazy and then once i bail on them it's really hard to go back so that that's my tale of woe yeah i think too it's being sealed is it's a little bit scary it's like what's going on out there i mean it's i think i think what helps me a lot is having the ambient feature where you've got the port and and you're able to uh to hear a little bit more of the room you have more of that confidence because it's so easy to just grab that left ear and just well i'll just clip it a little bit yep. it's still in my ear but i'm going to clip it a little bit just so i can hear just to break the seal yeah just to break the seal for there's something about that comfort but if you leave it alone and and have that ambient port or you know again if you've got a good crew that you're working with and they have some talent, you know, setting up ambient mics and putting yeah. that ambient mic, uh, having that mix added to to your ears. So but I think I think uh, the guitar players have the biggest challenge with in ears. You know, typically you're 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 if you've got a band of four guys that are all going into ears, the first two to do it are always the singer and the drummer. Yeah. You know, the guitar player is stubborn. No offense, but the guitar player is stubborn. No, I get it. And, and Dave has said this exact same thing for years. They want to hear the, and they got and they have to hear those in the the tones and they want to go up to the amp. I mean, it's it's definitely a little bit more of a challenge. It's a, it's a different thing. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I the thing that I like the last I've been on ears for 17 years, I think I I counted it the other day, but the last year and a half, especially the last year where I've wound up doing like more theater gigs, because that's the opportunity that I had to play throughout the pandemic, right. um, not having and now I, I've done this every time I've played, you know, as we've sort of been opening up a little bit, uh, I do not let there be a monitor wedge anywhere near me. So the idea right. of taking out a, an ear would would be catastrophic because I the only thing I would hear would be my drums. Um, right. You know, and so it's like I, I did it once at a I think it was at a theater show we were doing and I, I pulled an ear out because my mix just wasn't right. I think it might have even been a rehearsal or something. It was just a disaster. I needed to fix it. And I pulled it out. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so much worse. Like now I have no idea what I'm hearing because all I hear is me. And so right. taking that opportunity away, Paul, I, I realize it's to borrow a Van Halen term, it's living without a net, but, uh, you know, you live well without a net. Right. You've but been waiting um, to use that for the last hour. Haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? It just hit me. So I'll take it. But, uh, but do, like do, forcing yourself into that may get you to the end of the set to where you can say, all right, 
here's what I need to change. Like there's too much of this. And then maybe, maybe go into the second set with a, a better mix now that you sort of know what you need to fix. I mean, I realize it's a little bit of pain to get to the other side, but. No, it's clearly a commitment issue. I have to stick with it and I have yeah. to solve the problems and I got to get going. It's better for my voice. It's better for my performance in a long time. It, it is those three things though. It is the yeah. sensitivity to change the change and also like the energy that you feel when you take them off and then you're like, oh, that's a very different thing. And I don't it, I mean, you're playing high energy music. Is it is it the same for you? Do you do you feel what you want to feel the same as with out in ears in? It's way different. I mean, I'm with you. I mean, I love I love the energy for it. And I have this whole I call it a phobia or anything. But when I have to do the, you know, the the unchained scream, the somebody get me a doctor scream, the running with the devil scream. I got to clip that ear a little bit. And I don't know if it's a comfort thing, a scared thing, yeah. you know, it's, uh, but probably more of a, more of a habit thing, but right. you know, this is a great conversation. I mean, and it's funny because two nights ago, we literally told our guitar player, get the volume you need right now, because if you start to turn up or like you were saying, the drummer starts to play harder, it just makes things really difficult for everybody else. Everybody's got to commit to where they decide they want to be. Yeah. That's sound check. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like when they say when, you know, it's like well, they're telling the vocals, okay, you know, check your mic, check one, check two, check blah, blah. No, you got to sing. It, yeah. You yeah. know, belt it, belt it out. Like you're going to be doing it and you really, and it's true. You have to do it. So the other guys, where, where do they need me to be and so forth? So yeah. it's the same thing. Well, I have the seven pros and you know, when, when it is right, and I would say I'm hitting about 200 with all the baseball jerseys behind you. You can appreciate this. Uh, about two times out of 10, it is Nirvana and it changes everything. Yeah. But, you know, if I'm on a good streak of being eight in a row without having a great night with in-ears, I'm like, uh, it's not for me. And, you know, that type of thing. Drag, so, man. You're literally, you're counting the songs. You're like 15 more songs to go and we're done. 14, <laughs> 13, 12. But when you got a good guy that's, that's, that's really delivering that good mix, and everybody's dialed in. It's just nothing better. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, I, I want to ask you a question. You know, I'm really fascinated about your, your arc, your story as a singer. So take you, so you, you said, I want to do this. You went out and got a good vocal coach. Give three or four, gr your favorite best singing tips that you would relay from your journey as a singer. Because again, your journey is bizarre to me. Like you didn't <laughs> sing Brown Eyed Girl for 17 years. You, like you went right to <laughs> Van Halen, right? So that just doesn't happen too often. So what, what is your, what is your mojo for singing? Well, and it's funny because you hear, like I read something about Ronnie James Dio who never warmed up. You know, how do you not warm up? How do you, you know, I, I, I find that amazing, you know? Yeah. So for me, it's a, it's a few things. It's, uh, number one is you have to be hydrated. And I think what, what singers don't realize is it's not that if I'm playing tonight, it doesn't mean hydrate today. It means you hydrate yesterday. It's the day before, and then you continue that day. So, um, that's a biggie also rest. You've got to rest and that can be difficult if you're flying, you know, a lot of, you know, nowadays, a lot of bands are doing flyaway gigs and, it can be really rough if you if you don't have a lot of sleep and then you got to hop on a plane. Um, I mean, that's just that can be scary as a vocalist. Um, so I think the rest, the vocal warm ups, I think, um, you know, trusting, trusting your voice sometimes. You know, if you know you're having a rough night, sometimes you just got to trust it. Like if you don't have a good mix. Or, you know, like the last month I had to pull the ears out. I literally had to just go on full muscle memory and hope that everything was coming out correctly. Um, but I think the the interesting thing, and I got this from um, from Ralph, who's Michael Starr, Steel Panther, original Atomic Punks vocalist. And this guy is just the best out there. Like, I don't feel like I'm competing or being... Yeah, uh, looked up against David Lee Roth. It's more this guy. He's just wow. a fantastic singer. So I always like love to hear his tidbits and some of the things that he does. So there was one night we were playing in the mountains and the weather was dry 
And it was doing that one song to where you go into the second verse and all of a sudden I'm like, uh oh, if I'm having problems with this, it's going to be a rough night. And before I knew it, my voice was literally shot. Like I had nothing in the tank. There was, I didn't know what I was going to do. There's only, there's only so many times I could say, I go, people, I want to hear you singing. Or you just <laughs> <laughs> I can do that a lot as David Roth. It's very forgiving, but you can't do it all. The it time. is a forgiving role in that sense, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very lucky with that. So anyways, he, he had this thing that he did that he had told Joe, our bass player. And Joe told me during the guitar solo, he's like, try this. And it was literally taking a glass of water and sipping it through a straw and making the sound of, uh, how shall I say, the, the sound that a bong makes yes. if somebody were partaking in the yeah. activity as that. And it was literally gurgling and keeping those bubbles like at the at the bottom of your throat and just constantly coating your vocal cords. So that type of thing has bailed me out a few times when, cool tip. when yep. it hasn't been there. Because, you know, it's like you can always replace the snare drum during the show or a guitar string or, or, or yep. so forth or a bad, a bad uh, beta 57, whatever. But, you know, the the lead singer's voice, ooh, that's there's just that that'll make you want to quit and never do it again when that oh, yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's not fun. Fun. That's not fun. Yeah. That's a great tip. Thank you for sharing that. That's good. Good stuff. Yeah, so one, I got one last question. So we've had a, a interesting arc of uh, of conversations here about cover bands, tribute bands, original bands. And I just, uh, it, it, for, I'm amazed that the tribute band genre, I thought it was going to start petering out. I thought it was like a novelty thing, had its time, kind of cool, but it seems like it's as popular as ever. Uh, how about, you know, Brian's gestalt on, on, uh, on, on tribute bands? Do you, are tribute bands, you got to be all in, in order, if you're going to do it, do it. Or, or have you seen tribute bands that are the essence of the, of the artist, but not the whole thing. Do you see those bands and go, well, you know, why not go all the way? Why not be a tribute band? So what's your headspace about tribute bands? I have a very strong opinion about this, obviously. So, you know, when I got into it, you know, in the early two thousands and went down this road, it was still somewhat rare. wasn't that big when the atomic punk started in, you know, what, 94, 95, whatever it was, you know, it was at that point, you had a Led Zeppelin band doing it. You always had your Elvis and Beatles bands. And when the guys started the Atomic Monks, they were, they were actually embarrassed that the club that they played at, they're like, you want us to play all Van Halen? You know, people don't do that. That's <laughs> just weird. like the band couldn't wrap themselves around. What happened was the singer, uh, was having some drug problems. So they brought in another singer to fill in for a gig. And most of the stuff that they knew were all together were Van Halen and people went completely bananas over it. And the owner said, can you guys come back next week and just play Van Halen? And they're like, are you <laughs> crazy? And that's literally how it started. Wow. <laughs> oh, so at that point it was very rare and very odd. And, you know, originally David Lee Roth was actually going to take, the whole that was when he first started to come back and do his solo thing around 98 or so. And he was going to take just the atomic punks minus the singer. And then ultimately decided just to take the guitar player and was back on the road. But you know, when I got into it, it was like, oh wow, this is cool, the tribute thing. Whereas now I have a little bit different feeling about it. I feel like it is so oversaturated. There's mm -hmm. there's a tribute to to everybody. I think it it's really like anything else that's really watered down, you know, the market out there, you've got bands that'll just go out there and, you know, they'll play for free or play for a minimum amount. And it makes it harder for the bands that, that have worked. And, right. you know, it's, that's a tough part of it. The other tough part of it, like, you know, you were saying is, do you go all in, do you go in all in on the look? I mean, for us, I'm out there, you know, doing the look as well as Lance, our guitar player. And, and that all seems to work. The bass player and drummer, it doesn't make sense for them to look, to do it. They don't really look the part. And it feels like if bands are doing it, you know, and they don't look the part, you know, it just, sometimes it just looks odd. Mm -hmm. And for us, 
it's a it's a fine line. I you know at the beginning I used to do a lot of the Dave raps and just like like it was me and it's like I got to the point I'm like no one's coming in here mistaken that this isn't Van Halen. We're pretty you know we're really good, but it, people know it's not actually Van Halen. So instead, let's make it more. Let's honor the band. Let's honor them together because we were all in the same boat enjoying cool. the music back then. And and where we're really tested on stuff like that is when we go out on the Monsters of Rock cruises where we're the only tribute band on there. And you've got like Kicks and Cinderella and Tesla and Night Rangers and, and those bands. And, and, you know, we literally have the best set on the ship. But, you know, they're all originals and we're not. So we always try to have this this respect for those bands. And what happens is we usually end up bringing them on stage and bring up like Mike, uh, Michael Sweet from yeah. uh, from Striper or, or Nuno Bettencourt's jumped up with us a bunch of times. And and, you know, so it's like I think we we've, we've done a good thing of, of towing the line to where we're not over the top, where it's just out of control and campy because let's face it. Most people going out right now are in their twenties, early thirties. All those people, if you do the math, you know, they were born at the point where, you know, Gary or Sharon was already out of Van Halen. Oh, yeah. So when you try to go and pull off some of the stuff that Roth did when we were kids going to see them live, you know, unless you've got some diehard, uh, diehard fans that, that experience it, they're like, this guy is a clown. You know, like, <laughs> right. It's, it's really a good point. They don't get it. Yeah, no, that that's that that awareness of I, I like what you said about, you know, let's honor this band together. And and, right. that, and that's, that's really a where great idea. That's where tribute bands came from. It's a it's a fan celebration. It happens to be the musicians and right. the fan base. So it makes sense that that's the approach to it. And that, you know, what you said is actually I think it's universally helpful because a lot of us who are playing music are playing music that's 30, 40, 50 years old, right? Yep. There is there is a way to age gracefully with the music. The music is timeless, but the way you respect it and the way you perform it and the way you portray it actually requires a certain amount of dignity as as you get older. You're not that guy in the 20s. And the illusion is, unless you're damn, damn good at it, it's really hard to pull yeah. off 40 years into, into your singing career, right? It's, yeah, yeah. I love it. Absolutely. I mean, I look at, you know, if you look at our demographic, it's, it's the other night, you know, I was saying that, you know, a lot of the people are in their twenties and thirties and, you know, I looked out the other night and I'm like, God, I might be a young one at this show, uh, there you, you know, go. Yeah. but that's cool. You know, people are, people are enjoying the music and, and, you know, it's as long as I can kind of keep the voice together and, and, you know, it forces you to, to stay in shape, you know, you can't go up there and, and, you know, look ridiculous trying to pull that off. So, uh, so that would be actually my, my last question for you, man is, is, um, have you met David Lee Roth? Has he, has he commented on your singing reflected on your portrayal of him? I have not. Uh, I've only met, yeah, I've only met, I've met Sammy obviously. And Mike, as we, as we had talked about earlier, um, I've actually spent some time with Gary Sharon yeah. talking about, talking about his days, which I think, you know, if you are a Van Halen fan out there and, and immediately discounted the Van Halen three album with Gary Schroen. You should really go back and listen to some of the, some of the amazing work that, that Eddie did on that album is absolutely phenomenal. It's a great record. And and Gary is a heck of a singer. Oh. He's a nice guy and a heck of a singer. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was in a no, no win situation. No, he was the wrong fit for that fan base at that time. Like it, it, and, and they figured it out together and, 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 and parted gracefully. I think it might've been the only graceful part that ever happened in Van Halen. Yeah, I will say that I, I did see the Van Halen three tour with Gary Schroen at DeVore. That's home. Ah. Yes. That was what, six, seven years before that. And before I did my thing. And I'd say that was one of the most entertaining Van Halen shows I had seen, actually, because that was the first time you really got to see the band playing Mean Street. Somebody get me a doctor. I'm the one. Eddie singing. Michael Anthony singing. That was an absolute fun night to see that. That's interesting. That's cool. That's great. That's great. Great stuff, Brian. Thank you so much for taking yeah, some time with wonderful. us, man. Yeah. Is oh, there, absolutely. I love doing it. Is there anything else that, uh, that you want to share before we uh, before we let you uh, go on with your day, my friend? 
Yeah. I mean, if anybody, of course, is interested in Ultimate Ears and wants to talk about it, need some help with it, wants to purchase, of course, we've got a great sale going on. You can just go to the website, which is just backstage.ultimateears.com. Okay. So, um, happy to happy to discuss it and and help out with anything we can. Awesome, thank you for that. Yes, yeah. yeah. great this, stuff. Oh, well, I guess I should pump the Atomic Punks too. So yes, please We're on social media. Our website is I got to think about this www.theatomicpunks.com and my usual David Lee Roth line is like and you can still catch us up on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> I I heard the David Lee Roth voice come out there. That was pretty good. Just a little bit. Just <laughs> <laughs> that's outstanding. That's Just don't outstanding. ask. Don't ask for a scream, though. That might be a little tough, difficult to pull off this early. That's fine, man. Yep. We're, uh, we're we're not here to put you on the spot in that way. So there you go. Cool. Well, thanks again for joining us, folks. If you have questions for Brian, you know where to find him backstage. Ultimateears.com, the atomic And uh, and of course, you can send us email feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you, guys. Hey, Brian, tell everybody to always be performing. Always, always rock and roll and always be performing. There you go. There you go.